what i want to do is just talk a little bit about some of the terminology once again right and usually this whole scheduling problem is defined in terms of three important steps right the first step is the so called allocation problem right that is to say you need to make sure that you have sufficient resources to solve the problem at all okay right now there are two parts to that actually one is can i solve the problem at all second is can i solve the problem fast enough okay and what do i mean by the problem in this case it could be something like the differential equation right there is a task graph and i need to execute it so the first question that i would ask in the case of the differential equation for example is do i have processors that are capable of doing multiplication and second do i have processors capable of doing addition okay if i somehow uh, land up in a situation where i cannot do multiplications right then my allocation itself has failed i can't even go further beyond that i need to come i need to go and find some new kind of processor or new hardware which can actually do multiplication otherwise there's no point even discussing any further the second question of course might be yes i have a multiplier i have an adder right but then somebody also tells me that i have to finish everything within four time steps right from the previous example you saw that if i want to finish within four time steps i need at least two multipliers and two adders okay now ahead of time it is very difficult to predict this right right which means that this allocation problem by itself if i just look at a task graph and say oh you know how many multipliers how many adders do i need to finish this within some n time steps that in general that's not an easy uh, question to answer okay and it is in fact related to the next two steps of the scheduling problem the second step is something called binding okay and binding basically says fix the task to processor mapping okay so as an example when we come back over here right this what i have drawn over here right this is the binding for m1 binding for capital m1 and this is the set of bindings for capital a1 so what do i mean by that i'm basically saying that the operations a4 a5 a1 and a2 are going to happen on hardware capital a1 and only a3 is going to happen on capital a2 okay i could very easily have changed that binding i could have for example done any one of those a4 a5 a1 on a2 as well right i could have just moved it from a1 to a2 nothing is going to change in my schedule right it would have been a valid binding okay but when i am actually constructing my final hardware or my you know op, uh, the system which is going to implement this my finite state machine whatever it is i actually need to know precisely which hardware the operation is going to execute on okay so even though it looks like you know once i have drawn this chart oh, i could have, i could just pick any one a1 or a2 the point is i need to know that at some point i need to either decide it ahead of time or at least just before it actually goes on to the processor so the task to processor mapping fixing that is basically the binding problem and the third part of it is something called scheduling and the scheduling basically says fix the actual start times of the various tasks right in the example that we had over here the start time and finish time are you know the same it's just one number right it basically tells you in which clock cycle the operation is supposed to execute okay so these three steps are typically called the main you know the steps of the scheduling problem right so the allocate even though we normally call it the scheduling problem it actually involves three steps allocation binding and then scheduling okay now there are many different ways in which these could be done and the most important sort of distinction that we can make is you can do some operations at compile time right that is to say before you actually even start implementing or building the hardware for this versus some things which are going to happen at run time that is it's actually running on a set of processors or some finite state machine plus some data path okay what happens if i try to do allocation at run time right so what do i mean, what do i even mean by that right just to give you an idea an intuitive idea you might be familiar with this uh, you know so google compute engine for example or google app engine has this concept of something called runtime auto scaling 
right? Which basically means that you can run your web web application on their servers, and if it turns out that you know the load is increasing, the something in the system, right? The auto scaling system will automatically start allocating more hardware for your uh, problem. Okay, so this runtime auto scaling will basically take care of changing allocation itself at runtime. Even the number of resources that you have can be changed at runtime. Okay, clearly the example that we looked at earlier, the differential equation, is not something that where the runtime allocation is happening. Right, I am saying ahead of time that I have only two multipliers, two adders, and so on. Okay, so that is with a compile time fixed allocation. Right. So what do I mean by compile time? Compile time is whatever you know analysis or uh, study or changes that you make of the problem before you actually build the hardware and deploy it and runtime is when it is actually going and running on the uh, whatever set of hardware that you have got okay so you can see that you know again the same kind of uh, concepts apply even in the context of something like google app engine runtime auto scaling once again what are we doing we have a bunch of tasks right after all a web server can also be thought of as a task every time it gets a request it has to do something and respond okay so those tasks also need to be adapted at runtime the next problem that comes up is binding okay and what do we do with binding we need to do we need to essentially answer the question of which particular processor is going to, is this going to run on right now continuing with the web application example it would mean that you know as and when each request comes in from the network there will be some dispatcher which says okay you know go and run on this processor or go and run on this uh, process okay similarly if i go down to a single you know whatever is there in your laptop uh, right now you probably have at least a dual core system right and the operating system basically takes care of each and every you know it's basically doing some kind of time multiplexing right many tasks are there that are currently running in the background and those tasks need to be brought to the front processed and then sent back into the sent back to sleep right and this happens like hundreds of times per second okay so if i need to do that if i have more than one processor then the operating system basically needs to also take care of the selection every time it is a time to run a task it brings it up and says okay are you going to run on processor 1 or processor 2 and dispatch it on to that okay of course in practice we might also have some affinity and you know saying something like okay this particular task i would prefer it to run on processor 0 or processor 1 right because it was running there already i want it to continue running on that processor similarly i might also have something which says don't run anything else on this particular processor leave it free for this and so on okay that is all if i am trying to do run time processor selection on the other hand the example that we saw the processor selection you know the a1 for example capital a1 i knew exactly which tasks are going to run on that so the binding is also done finally comes the problem of scheduling fixing the start times right now this leads us to an interesting concept which is something called a self timed schedule okay and what does self timed mean let's say that i have already fixed the allocation number of processors and i have also decided that each task is going to run on you know processor p1 or processor p2 i can still make it self timed by saying that you know i will accept the possibility that each of those tasks can take a different amount of time right so rather than saying that a multiplication finishes within one clock cycle or addition finishes within one clock cycle what if a multiplication takes some arbitrary amount of time to execute and i don't know that ahead of time it's some random variable maybe right a more realistic example of course is something like the web application right so even if i say that you know all web applications that are requesting one particular type of information will go on to this processor right it still might have the situation that the amount of time required to actually retrieve some data from a database do the processing and give back the answer varies okay it's not a fixed amount of time so if that is the case then the scheduling problem goes into this thing called self timed mode right self timed basically says that now each and every task each operation has some notion of when it starts and when it finishes okay 
so i can actually sort of give some kind of a start signal to each operation to tell it okay now go ahead and execute right and then it is completed it then raises a signal to inform the scheduler or the control state machine something and say that okay i'm done you know you can either go ahead and put a new task on this processor or you can take the outputs generated by my task and give them to whoever was waiting for it okay so self timed is also nice in the sense that you know if there is variability in the execution time of the tasks it can take care of that without necessarily having to worry about the allocation and binding problems okay of course it increases complexity because now i need to have some kind of a controller sitting over there which sends these start signals to various tasks and waits for them to finish right waits for done signals to come back from them okay now as i said you know after all of this is done i will be taking up some examples of vivado hls high level synthesis and basically the examples that we will be looking at over there will in fact involve this whole kind of handshaking behavior right so i will be able to send start signals to different operations and once they are done they will in fact generate their done signals which i can look at and say okay fine you know time to move on to the next operation okay and in fact it is also possible for tasks to without necessarily having a central controller to automatically pass on this start and done signals to each other okay both of those are possible now of course the ideal situation is none of these the ideal situation is can you fix everything statically at compile time okay if i can say this is the number of processors this task goes on to this processor at this point in time all of that information if i can get that at compile time right that makes it easy for me to build hardware to do this right literally if you want to go back to the example that we have over here right uh, the schedule that we have in a picture like this all that i need to do is have a time counter right something which is going 0 1 2 3 the schedule is over so once again go back 0 1 2 3 and so on right at each one of those 0 1 2 3 what happens there will be some multiplexers that will take care to make sure that m1 m2 a1 a2 get the correct set of inputs okay and of course, some of their outputs then need to get stored in register some of them need to be read in at correct points in time etc but otherwise there is no complexity at all involved in the system no finite state machine that needs to be looking for start signals or done signals or anything else everything is just controlled by that counter okay so these are the different ways in which we can actually implement these things in practice